Hey friends, thanks for joining us for worship today. My name is Josh Howard. I get to work here uh, on staff at Heritage Church as one of the pastors. And we want you to know no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, we are so glad that you're with us today. As a church, we exist to connect people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. And, and so we invite you in the next couple of moments to worship with us in song and in prayer and with the teaching. Feel free to engage however is most comfortable for you. And we believe that God has something to say to you today. So if, if this is your first time joining us for service, or if you feel like you've got a question or maybe a prayer request, or you wanna to talk to one of our pastors, we invite you to go to heritageqc.com connect and someone from the pastoral team would love to connect with you soon. And we're excited and expectant for what God's gonna do in our time together. And so I wanna just invite you to lift your voice as we worship our great and mighty God today. your voices with me and sing this together this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we pray we'll see break down every wall we'll watch the joy Yeah. 
of our praise. Every day, it's just, it's a new thing. It's a new blessing that he gives us. One of my, uh, one of the parts that I love most about working for the church actually is to be able to see and hear and sometimes be part of just the beautiful, radical ways that God is transforming our lives and just how he is so faithful all the time. Uh, but I actually, I wasn't always able to see his faithfulness. Six, seven years ago, I had doubts of whether or not he could save me, whether he could pull me from the life that I was living, from the circumstances that I was in. And I imagine some people here today have come with your own doubts, either similar to the ones that I had, or maybe something like, is God gonna be able to provide a meal for my family tonight? Is God going to be able to mend my relationships or heal a sick family member? And while these are totally valid doubts to have, we should not let them hold us captive. When we're in these moments of doubt, we can turn to his word and see how faithful and how great he is. So I'm going to read for you um, from Isaiah 40, verses 26 through 31. It says, look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all of the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So in those moments, when you do have those doubts, just remember that we have a faithful God. We have a powerful, powerful God who wants to move in just incredible ways in your life. And so in these times, we continue to praise him. dark tried to hide you and steal you away and death tried to keep you inside of the grave the enemy fought you he tried but he lost Cannot be stopped. And cried for the freedom and tear down the walls. The weight of our burden, you carried it all. Our fears and failures had dead on the cross you cannot be stopped a mover of mountains a breaker of chains Jesus has triumphed over the grave sing hallelujah the battle is won nothing can stay against our God. 
God And stand on your victory And shout out your praise A miracle maker You're mighty to save can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing, there is, there is nothing, there is nothing that can stop us. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you here in this morning saying that there is nothing that can stop you, nothing that can hold you back. And so as we open your word here, we know that you are desiring to do something new and unique within each one of us. And so, Holy Spirit, now we invite you to just continue to speak to us as you already have been through your word and through your servant. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to go ahead and have a seat. Hey, Heritage family, welcome to this first Sunday in August as we continue pressing into this series called There Is More. My name is Jeremiah. I get to be one of our teaching pastors here, and I just want to say welcome. We are so excited about getting to 
press into God's word together to say, today and hear what he has to say to us. Now, for those of you who are joining us online, men in Kiwani, and those of you following us on TV, I want to encourage you later on in our service, we're going to be participating in communion together. Communion is an, is an observance, it's an act that unites us together where we recall the broken body and poured out blood of Jesus. And we would love as we participate in person here for you to join us where you are. So take a moment right now, go uh, find some crackers or bread or food and some juice or water and get those kind of set aside for a little bit later on, okay? And those of you here in the room with me, you should have received uh, one of these handy dandy elements packets. If you did not, those are available uh, on the way in. Now, as we step into the conversation today, I want you to think of a moment or a circumstance or, or some time in your life when you were desperate for everything to be different or for something to be different. One of those moments, one of those times, one of those circumstances where you were so desperate to see it be anything other than what it was, you started working toward that end and you could almost touch the outcome that you desired. Maybe for you it's it's getting out of debt and you just keep working it and working it and working it and just as you're about to be debt free, it feels like, man, that just falls through your fingers. That maybe it's, it's experiencing health in your relationship. You know that the relationship that's nearest and dearest to you could be so much more. And so you're, you're doing what you know to do to try to get that relationship to function a little bit better, a little healthier, to move toward all it can be. And somehow, every time you almost get right there, it slips through your fingers. Maybe it's a promotion at work. And somebody else keeps getting promoted over you every time you think it should be your turn. Maybe for you, it's some other circumstance altogether when it comes to your physical or emotional health where you can see what you want. You're pursuing it. You're doing what you know to do, what you think you should do. And yet somehow, when you come up just to the edge of what it is that you're looking for, it falls apart again. I think we all have these different areas in our lives, these different spaces, even today, where we have a picture of what should be, where we're working toward what could be, and when we expect and experience a little taste and expect so much more, and it just doesn't come to be, how is it that you and I can kind of thrive in those spaces? What does it look like to not just see that opportunity, to not just see that thing that we desire so much? and almost get there, but actually to receive the goodness of God that he has for us. In my own life, in my own world, there have been times where, where I was so desperate to find fulfillment in any number of things. I worked hard and tried to find it. And it would always slip through my fingers. I remember, I remember struggling with what if God was calling me to a life of, of singleness with him and how, how that is something that he can do and that if that's what he had for me, I so desperately wanted to do that well. And I would start to pursue that and then get so frustrated at how dissatisfied I was. I felt like I was failing in what God had for me in that part of my life. When, when I met Sarah and, and we kind of discerned that God had us for each other, I was so desperate to see a healthy and vibrant marriage happen that I remember when we were first married working hard to try to make that happen. But the problem with any relationship is that there's always someone else involved, right? And no matter how perfect I was, no matter how much I did everything right, man, there was another person, and she would tell you the opposite story of that, right? We push, and we work, and we drive, and we yearn, and we long, and so we follow whatever rule book we have, whatever, whatever the pattern is that we've been given to try to find the thing that we're reaching out for, and then we get frustrated, and we feel lost, and we get disappointed when that very thing seems to slip from our fingers over and over. 
Now, we're not the first ones who have, who have dealt with that. In fact, we're going to be in the Bible today in John chapter 5, if you're following along. John is the fourth book of the New Testament. It's one of the Gospels, which means just the story of the life of Jesus. And so if you can get to the New Testament and get four books in, you'll find John. We're in the fifth chapter there. We're following along in the life story of Jesus as he's interacting with a group of people, or one person in particular, who for almost 40 years has had a debilitating illness. For 40 years, he has done what he knows to do to try to get healing, and that's to drag himself to a particular place in hopes that this might be the day where he encounters something supernatural that will allow him to experience healing healing. He's following the rules that he knows to follow. He's following the same pattern day after day. And every day we'll see in his story that somebody finally receives the gift he's waiting for. It's like he just barely misses it for 40 years almost. So this is part of what we're going to intersect with here today. You know, I think for that man and for us, we can get to this place when it comes to those spaces in our lives where we're desperate to see something different happen, where we are trying so hard to find a new and better and living way, when we get disappointment after disappointment, that we can become convinced there just might not be enough to go around. I mean, think of the way that we interact with this stuff of, of opportunity. We tend to think that somebody else's opportunity means that now we won't get one. That someone else's success must somehow mean I won't be as successful. That s- someone else's healing even might mean that there's less of it for me. Someone else's provision. Someone else's whatever. If there just isn't enough to go around. And so we claw and we fight and we push and we try to be one of the ones who gets in that limited bit of stuff, of healing, of hope, of life, of opportunity. But here's the thing. This is not how the economy of heaven works. We're going to intersect with a man in his story who this is how the people around him were operating. And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, this is not how the economy of heaven works. This is not how it works in the kingdom of God. In fact, there's a a simple phrase I want to share with you that undergirds most of the conversation in in the story of Jesus. And in fact, throughout the scriptures, it's a simple phrase that is life changing for us if we believe that it's the truth from God's heart for us. In fact, I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm just going to ask you to say it with me, all right? The simple statement is this. There is always more. All right, so say it with me. There is always more. Now, what that tells me is you need some convincing, and that's okay because we're going to get there. There is always more of God's goodness. There is always more of his provision. There is always more of his purpose for us. There is always more of his healing and power and love and joy and peace and patience. There is always more. God is a God of abundance, not of scarcity. We see that throughout the scriptures. God is a God who understands there is always more so much that he gives generously and lavishly, expectantly, and invites us to experience that same thing with him. There is always more. There is always more to know and to experience and to encounter with God. There is always more. We never reach the end of what he has to show us or of what he has for us. That's part of the heart behind this there is more conversation that we're having together. There are no shortages with him. Now, the always more that God has for us isn't limited to what we know of him or how we think he should work or what we think God should do. That's going to come back later. But in the meantime, as we dig into Scripture, I just want you to hold in your mind, whether you're convinced of it or not, that phrase, there is always more. And as you hold that and sit in it, we're going to dig into what the Scriptures say 
today. So again, we're in the life of Jesus, and He is revealing the goodness of God and the power of His kingdom in amazing ways. We've seen Jesus up until this point in John turn water into wine. We've seen Jesus interact with a, with a foreign uh, people and see their town radically transformed with the power of Jesus. After that, Jesus is rejected by His own countrymen as he performs his leadership there. So here's what's happened. Water to wine. Jesus has a transforming encounter with people who are, who are other, who are distant, who are different, and his own people waiting for him reject the goodness of God in Jesus. And then we see that Jesus does a phenomenal, impossible, long-distance healing for somebody. And now we pick up the story where Jesus is on his way to a natural pool with platforms all around it, porches or porticos they're called. People believe that every once in a while, every once in a while, that an angel or somebody will stir the water and they'll make that water move from still water to what the ancients would call living water. See, living water was any time the water would flow and move. And so there's a moment they believe that somehow supernatural, the still water will become living water. And if you can be the first one to enter into the living water as it's stirred, then whatever it is that you're seeking in terms of wholeness and healing, then it will, it, it will come to you. You'll experience it. But you've got to be the first one. And so there's this, there's this crowd of people you can imagine who are there desperate to get in. And whenever that happens, they push and prod and move into the space. They crush other people under them to try to be the first one in because what? They're convinced there's just a little bit of healing to go around. They didn't hear the message this morning that there's always more. But here they are. And if you don't think that that's part of our human nature, just the other day, I got to spend hours and hours in some international airports. And you would think that we weren't all getting on the same plane to the same destination as crowds of people crushed into that tiny little jetway, right? We all have to get seated and strapped in, people. We don't all have to, like, push and prod and crush each other to get to our seats. But this is what happens. If you've traveled on an airplane at all, you know that this is what happens, right? People just want to be the first one in. All that that means is you're one of the last ones off sometimes. But here we are. Our nature is just to push people out of the way so we can get what we think is a limited resource. And that's what's happening here. So here we go. John chapter 5 says, Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for such a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Now, let's pause there for a second. I love Jesus. I think he's awesome. There are some moments in Scripture where on first glance I go like, what are you thinking? Let's just put, okay, this guy has been literally dragging himself to the edge of the water. We don't know for how long, but he's needed to do it for 38 years or so. And he gets there every day for 38 years by dragging himself down to the water. Jesus sees him, knows this is his plight. And what's the question that Jesus asks? Hey, bud, you want to not do that anymore? You want to get well? Of course he wants to get well. There must be something else kind of beneath the surface of that question because otherwise, doesn't it seem almost cruel doesn't it seem almost like, like this man is being made fun of? That's not the heart of Jesus. We know that. And so when we look at how the question is asked, the, the framing of the question for Jesus is this. He is asking Jesus, or Jesus is asking this man, are you determined to live in the way of wholeness? Do you want to get well? Are, are you determined to live in a different way? 
You've been coming down here day after day, convinced there just isn't enough to go around. But what if, what if, my friend, instead of waiting for the water to become living water there, what if living water just walked up to you? What if you get an opportunity to experience what it is that you've been longing for in a different way than you ever expected, in a different way than you thought God ever could or should? If that happens, are you going to walk in the way of wholeness? I think for you and for me, as as we sit in this space, we can resonate with this man who for 38 years had been looking for God to move in one particular way, in one particular moment. I don't know if he knew what to do at first when this takes place. In fact, we're going to read through more of the story here in a moment. What we see there is that the man was convinced there wasn't enough to go around, that he was fixated on what he thought he needed the way he thought he needed it. And so this simple question, do you want to get well? Are you committed to walking in the way of wellness and wholeness? That question is also one I believe Holy Spirit of the risen Jesus is asking you and me today in our spaces where we're desperate to see anything other than what it is where we're desperate to see God's goodness on display, where we're desperate to know that our input matters, where we're desperate to know that God can be trusted even when things seem impossible, where we're desperate to know that even though we've been dragging ourselves through the muck and mire of life for year after year after year after year after year after year, hoping that today might be the day that something changes. That here, in that space, I believe if we could hear with spiritual ears, we would hear in that space of relationship, of loneliness, of listlessness, of hopelessness, of frustration, of fear, we would hear the voice of Jesus asking you and me, do you want to get well? Do you want to experience the abundance of God's Spirit and goodness? Are you willing to walk a different path? The story continues. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. You can almost hear the heartbreak in the interaction here. Are you committed to the way of wellness? to a different way. And the man, again, he's going, well, there's just one particular way that I know of. And every time, every time, it feels like this breakthrough is going to happen. Somebody literally walks all over me and gets in before I have a chance to get there. It's a heartbreaking moment. I, I just want you to sit in that with Holy Spirit, even in this moment. To know that Jesus invites you in the question, do you want to get well? To bring the space of heartache and frustration and brokenness before him. To bring it before him and say, do I want to get well? That's what I've been trying to do. And every time, I don't know what's going on, God, but every time it feels like I just miss it. Sometimes it's your people, other people, who seem to be keeping me away from it. All I've needed for 38 years is one person, one person to lay aside their own need to be first and let me get in the water first. That's all I've needed. It's okay for you to sit in that space. I, when I read this story through even just this morning, the things in my own mind and heart that bubbled up to the surface where I was reminded of the places where I've been so longing for God to move and still sitting in disappointment and wonder. He is there. And he invites us to be fully present with us in that powerful question, do you want to get The story continues. So Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. And I love how John in the story is just like, so yeah, Jesus said, okay, fine, be healed. And the, and the guy is like healed. 
He just picks up his mat and starts walking away. It's an incredible moment in the life of Jesus and in the story. And yet what we're going to find out is this particular healing isn't the point of the story. You see, this, this man's story, we don't, we don't know his name other than the invalid. We, we don't know anything else about his story other than that he showed up day after day. He was doing the right thing as far as he understood to do it, trying moment after moment to get into the space of healing. That's what we know. And then he has this experience. You see, he had been looking for God to move in one particular way with one particular outcome. And I believe the experience he had blew his mind. Because God showed up. Instead of him having to get into the water, living water walked up to him. If you look at the story again, I think you're going to notice something. You're going to notice that Jesus offered healing to this man not because of anything that the man had done. There wasn't, there wasn't anything that the man had done to deserve an interaction with Jesus. There were crowds of people there that day. He didn't expect the man to say magic words or pray the right kind of prayer in Jesus' name in order for this to happen. No, no. Jesus sees the man, goes to the man, and offers healing to him. In just a few moments in the story, we're going to see that this one whose whole life is changed, he makes a decision that actually betrays the person of Jesus. And yet, Jesus, knowing that would happen, still goes to the man and gives him the way of wellness, gives him healing. For you and for me, this is so important. In our do-you-want-to-get-well spaces, where we maybe have become convinced it doesn't work that way in our lives, there isn't enough to go around for us, that maybe somebody else gets to experience wholeness and health and the goodness of God. That in our do you want to to get well spaces, we are invited to encounter the God of more than enough. To see him move and live in a way that we never thought possible. If only we'll choose not to be limited by what we think God ought to do in our given circumstance man didn't have to say or do the right thing for the God of the universe to come to him and see him. I don't know how many others that day uh, were healed. The, The writer focuses on this very thing. I think some of us are are looking for one particular outcome in one particular way, just like this man. But like this man, what we need is not the thing we've been seeking. We need an encounter with Jesus. And that's what happened for him. He had an encounter with Jesus, and he began to see what we all need to know, and it's that Jesus is the embodiment of whatever it is you're seeking. Jesus is fulfillment in the flesh of whatever it is you're seeking. Are you looking for purpose? It's found embodied in Jesus. Are you looking for wholeness? It's found embodied in Jesus. Are you looking for a sense of identity? It's found embodied in Jesus. Are you looking for hope and light and life? It's found embodied in Jesus. Are you looking for a path of knowing that you are living a life that matters, that is poured out in the very best way for the very best things? It is found in its fullness in Jesus. And the moment you and I stop desiring an encounter with Jesus where he brings those things to us and instead we start pursuing what Jesus might offer us we find that we're like the man doing the right things day after day after day after day frustrated that what we seek we are not finding because we've forgotten that Jesus is the embodiment of everything we seek and what he offers us may be very different in terms of how and what we thought we needed, but he will bring it and he will give it in fullness. Some of us are doing the same things and having the same conversations day after day after day. We're making the same choices week after week after week, month after month after month, and we're sitting in frustration and worry and wonder, why won't God do something different? And I wonder if in that space of do you want to get well, 
he's inviting us into a new and different way. So the story continues here. It says, the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Hold up. Supernatural healing. Dude just walked up carrying his mat, and the first thing that happens is he gets a ticket from the Sabbath police for carrying his mat. The Sabbath is a day that's completely dedicated to this idea that there is always more and that God's goodness and, pr- and provision are something that we can rest in. And so you would think that the people calling out this man who are religious leaders who ought to know there is always more and that Sabbath is a day reminding us to rest in the goodness and provision of God, that they would say, oh my, Sabbath itself, rest itself that we've been seeking for is here in the person of Jesus. But that's not what happens. He replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was because Jesus slipped away. And later on, Jesus comes up to the man. There's an interesting interaction. We don't have time to unpack there. And then the man goes back and tells him, okay, now I know who it was. And so the story continues here. Because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work. To this very day, I too am working. For this reason, they tried to kill him all the more, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but because he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Can I just tell you what happened here? In this are, do you want to get well space in this space of is there enough or is there more than enough? We see that this group of people could not expand their capacity to see God moving in a way other than exactly how they thought he should. Not just how they thought he could. This group of people had given God a script and it said, if you're going to heal somebody, It has to be in this way on these days. They declared to God how he should be interacting. If you don't see a problem with how that might work, we begin to see it unpacked here. They're so unable to see the goodness of God embodied before them that rather than experience that same goodness, rather than hear the question asked to the man and asked to them, do you want to get well? They begin to move to destroy the person and ministry of Jesus. Friends, there are spaces and places in your life right now, today, I'm convinced where the Holy Spirit is asking you, do you want to get well? And are you willing to walk the way of wellness, even if it means God doing something in your life you never thought possible in a way you never would have chosen, but trusting that he is good and that he cares for you, that he is God, and we can rest in him. There is always more. God is the God of abundance, but sometimes we reduce our experience of him. We limit our expectations of how God will answer, of of what he will bring. We limit our vision of how he can move, what he should do and how he should do it. We live in a limited capacity to see and to trust. And what if... What if in the do you want to get well space in your life right now, God is inviting you to live beyond your current capacity with him? In fact, that brings us to just kind of a reflection question today. Where does God want to move beyond your current capacity? Where does God want to move beyond your current capacity? The Pharisees looked the fullness of God in the face and they wanted to end him because they refused to allow God's goodness to expand their view and their participation in their heart. 
Where does God want you to move beyond your current capacity? Where does he want to move beyond your current capacity? Where does he want to expand what you have capacity to see and experience, of of what you think he can do, of the patterns that you've established, of where you think you have little to no value to offer, of where you see your circumstances in the way that he does, of where you see others the way that he does, where this morning is Holy Spirit asking you, do you want to get well? And how will you respond, even if it means everything will change, but God can be trusted because of him there is always more? And just a moment, we're going to participate in communion together. Communion is, and if you have your elements with you, friends online and TV, you can go ahead and and get those together now. Communion is this sacred observance. It's an act of remembering the goodness of God. As followers of Jesus, we partake of communion. Anybody can eat some bread and drink some juice. But it's only those who have been redeemed by Christ Jesus who partake in communion. We have something called open communion at uh, Heritage. It's an invitation. If you are a follower of Jesus, you can participate. You don't have to be a member. We just ask that you're a follower of his. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, not yet ready to take that step, then then we just ask that you sit in the space and join with us uh, even as you observe the, the communion moment. But I can't think of a better day to step into relationship with Jesus than this one. Because here's the thing. If you've been hearing Jesus ask you, do you want to get well? then the first step of receiving the wholeness that he offers us is to receive him as the one who gave himself for you, whose body was broken for your healing, whose blood was poured out for your life, to ask him to be the one who forgives you and leads you. And if you've done that, then then you've taken the first step. You've said the first yes in the path of do you want to get well. If you've never done that before, I invite you to do it. It's just a simple matter of declaring your need for him, asking him to be the one who forgives and leads you. If you do that, be sure to speak with a member of our team. We want to join you in your journey. Now, communion is, as I said, this sacred observance. It's also a reminder that there is more than enough, that God did not spare his own son but gave him freely for us. That there is more than enough wholeness for you here and now in the land of the living. That there is more than enough life here and now for you in the land of the living. God says there is always more And he invites us in ways we don't always expect or want, but that are better than we could design or desire. Maybe for you, your starting point isn't stepping into relationship with Jesus. You've done that, but it's a simple prayer before we partake that is simply this. God, I trust you to give me exactly what I need when I need it trust that there is always more with you. Give me exactly what I need when I need it. And we partake joining the church, the church universal, as we eat the bread and take the cup, remembering the death of Jesus till he comes, uniting our hearts with him in expectancy and resting in the knowledge that there is more than enough. So I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to partake. Father, Son, Spirit. God, we thank you for the gift of communion. We thank you for the gift of these elements. That you are the God of more than enough. That there's always more with you. And so for those of us who haven't yet entered into relationship with you, 
I pray that you would lead us now in showing us what it looks like to receive you as the one who leads and forgives us. For those of us who have, God, we ask you to give us exactly what we need when we need it and help us to trust in you even when things don't go the way we think they ought to. We ask you to search us and know us, to see if there's any offensive way in us, to give us courage to turn from it. Even as we partake of the bread and the cup, as we remember your body and blood, and we commune with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you partake, please?
Oh my goodness, what, what a powerful service this has been. If, if something during the service struck a chord with you and you'd like to have someone pray with you or, or maybe you have a follow-up question or, or something that was said during the sermon that resonated with you, I would encourage you to go to heritageqc.com connect and one of us from the pastoral team will reach out to you. It's, it's also a great way just to find out maybe, maybe there's a group or a class or, or some kind of event that, that would be great for you to connect into. And, and that's a way to just know what's going on. If you've been impacted by the service in any way, we would encourage you to just consider partnering with us by giving to the Ministry of Heritage Church, which makes programs like this possible. And one of the easiest ways to do that is by going to heritageqc.com slash give and, uh, and just interacting with the webpage there. We thank you in advance for, for the generosity uh, that you will display. And we also just want to thank you for joining us for worship. We value your presence and we, we love that you are here and we hope to see you next week.